Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening again. And uh, uh, we would like to welcome Mr. Uh, Karl Honoré to our uh, Multaka Salon this night. Uh, Karl Honoré is an award-winning writer, broadcaster, and voice of the uh, slow movement. He graduated from the University of Edinburgh with degrees in his history and Italian. After working with street children in Brazil, he covered South America and Europe for The Economist, Observer, Houston Chronicle, National Post, and Time Magazine. His book, On the Benefit of Slowing Down, In Praise of Slow, Under Pressure, and the slow fix have been published in 34 languages and landed on bestsellers list in many countries. His TED talk has been viewed 2.8 million times. His new book, Boulder, Making the Most of Our Longer Lives, Explorer's Attitude to Aging. While writing his first book about slow, Carl was giving a speeding ticket. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, welcome, Carl, to Al Multaka. As parents, uh, thank you very much. As parents, we tend to push our children to finish their meal and homework quickly, to pick up uh, the mess in the rooms ASAP. So, while searching for perfection, we are pushing them towards failure. Whereas, if they slow down in their assignment, we will be helping them. Uh, reaching their full potential. How can we achieve the right balance, not only in our children's life in general? Yeah, um, well, that's an enormous question. <laughs> Shall I start by talking about children first? Well, I it seems to me that in the last generation, we have uh, transmitted the virus of hurry from adults to children, so that for many children now, uh, life childhood is a race to perfection. They come out of the womb and it's just, you know, baby Einstein DVDs, it's private tutoring, it's uh, sign language class, it's just endless activity. And the trouble is that this doesn't work, that children actually need slowness. They need slowness as much or more than grown-ups do because it's in those moments of unstructured time, of just playing freely, of not being on the clock, of not having a parent or a teacher or an adult pushing them and telling them what to do or how to do it better, or even of boredom. You know, we're all so terrified of boredom nowadays. You know, for all of human history, when a child came to a parent and said, I'm bored, that was the child's problem, right? You know, the parent would say, well, too bad, go, and go outside and play. Or, or they would use that immortal phrase, they would say, use your imagination. Now a child comes to a parent and says, I'm bored, and the parent feels like they're failing. And we say, oh no, I'm failing, my child is bored, where's the iPad? Or maybe we need another extracurricular in the schedule. No, no, and, and, and no again. Because it's in those moments of boredom, of not knowing what's coming next, of not being rushed, that children learn how to, how to think, how to use their imagination, how to be creative, how to uh, get along with their peers, how to enjoy the moment, how to look into themselves and work out who they are rather than what everyone else wants them to be. So, the question I suppose was, was how, right? I mean, I think we just, most of us, I mean, it, 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 there's no universal recipe, right? I can't sit here and say this is exactly what everybody family has to do. But every family, every parent, I think, needs to stop for a moment and just push pause and close out all of the panic and the competition and the sound and fury that is swirling around parenting and look inward and ask, what kind of family do I want to have? Who are my children? Because not every child is, is the same. Every child is unique. Every child has their own metronome, their own rhythm, their own tempo. So take the time to look in and, and work out what the right balance is. So maybe for some children it will be two extracurriculars. For some it might be one. But for very few children, is it going to be five extracurriculars, right? So I think less is more is a natural um, piece of advice for every, every family when it comes to activities. And then, of course, with technology, then, again, that's a whole other question about uh, using things more so, sensibly. Uh, as me, uh, Ms. Van der Rohe said, uh, less is more. Yes, it applies on everything in life. And uh, by slowing down, do you mean uh, to make priority or uh, to slow down on every aspect? But when I say slow, I don't mean doing everything very, very slow. I mean, that would, that would be silly, right? I'm not an extremist or a fundamentalist of slowness. I love speed, right? Faster, 
is often better, and we all know that, and I'm a naturally fast person, and I think fast is good. This slow philosophy, this slow creed is about doing things at the right speed. It's about knowing that there are times to be fast, but there are also times to slow down, and it's about finding the right speed, that music term, tempo giusto, the correct tempo for each moment. So slow, in a sense, is about, as you said, priorities. It's about quality over quantity. It's about doing one thing at a time, which now seems so countercultural when we're all multitasking constantly. Slow means, uh, it means being mindful, right? Being present and in the moment, giving your full attention to something so that you do it well and enjoy it thoroughly. And once you get that, you take that slow chip and you arrive at each moment thinking, how can I do this thing not as fast as possible, but as well as possible? Once you make that change, then everything gets revolutionized. Uh, when I read your book, I, I was thinking uh, how fast we're going because of the stereotyped image uh, implemented, as you said, in societies. Mm. And it differs from one society to into another, uh, from the Middle East into the States or uh, Europe. Uh, but uh, you made me stop for two few days and uh, put a list of uh, things that I need to get rid of it mm -hmm. and I need to uh, examine in order to make life uh, proper. Can you tell us about your second book? Uh, because is it, is it the opposite of the first or what make you uh, Well, the second book is, uh, is, is under pressure. That's about children. Yes. So the first book is in praise of slow, which is about the slow revolution in every walk of life. The second book is under pressure. That's about slowing down with children, education, parenting, and families. Do you mean my third book or my fourth? Because I have four books, right? So no, 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 <laughs> fourth, I mean you're oh, my new book, right. Okay, my new book is called uh, Boulder. Yes. And it's about uh, longevity and the fact that we are living longer lives than ever before in human history, uh, but that we have failed to change our attitudes to aging. We're still, it seems to be, infected by a cult of youth that we feel that everything to do with growing older is bad. And I suppose with my first three books, I was taking on or attacking the cult of speed and arguing that faster is not always better. With Boulder, what I'm doing is taking on the cult of youth and saying that younger isn't always better. Because the truth is, as we grow older, many things stay the same and some things actually get better. But that's not the message that's coming at us from the culture all around us, which tells us that from the age of 30 or 35, it's all downhill, that everything gets worse, that every birthday makes you less attractive, less energetic, less creative, less productive, less fun, less happy, less yourself, right? When it's just not true. I mean, and the, what I, I found that I myself had got infected by this cult of youth, and that was the starting point for me to think about writing the book, and I, I wanted to I suppose I wanted to feel better about growing older myself, and, and thankfully it, it worked. You know, I, I, I had a terrible ageist attitude, right? A really downbeat, grim view of growing older, and, and writing the book has completely transformed that. I feel a whole lot better about it. Perfect. You made us uh, feel better also. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, getting older is related to dying, and uh, maybe there's a psychology about the death mm. while uh, we're getting older. But as you said, on the other side of the story, we are more mature, we are uh, more w wise, and uh, we tend to enjoy life from a different perspective. And maybe this is the quality of life that you are uh, aiming to tell us. And we look forward to mm -hmm. read this book. Uh, if speed was a virus, it would then be contagious. What about hyperactive people? Can they adapt and benefit from the slow movement? Yes, I mean, I think some people find it harder to slow down than other people, no question. Some people's internal metronome is set faster. But everyone can do it. I mean, I, I, I am myself an extremely fast person, and I have managed to reconnect with my inner tortoise. So if I can do it, I feel like pretty much anyone <laughs> can do it. And, and I, in the work I've been doing now over the last, since the book first came out, 15 years, so I travel around the world and I do talks and workshops and make TV shows. And I see people who on the outside look like lost causes. You think that person is lost to speed. They will never slow down ever again. And they do. You know, it, it, yeah, it does. I mean, I made a TV show in um, Australia, which was called Frantic 
family rescue. So I don't know, do, do people here know um, Super Nanny? Do, did you have Super Nanny in there? Okay. Okay, so essentially in this TV show, I'm Slow Nanny. So I get these very fast families who are running all the time and they're always on computers and things and I get them for one month and I have to slow them down, right? And so it's on the first day I, I, I arrive, it's one of the things I deal with is technology. And I arrive on the first day with a box called the gadget box. And every electronic gadget in the house, so iPads, phones, TV, Xbox, everything goes into the box for the whole month. And it is a very traumatic day. There are tears that day, right? And I don't just mean the children, right? There are parents crying when they have to give over their phone. And, but at the end of the month, the th same thing always happens. The parents and the, fa the children come back. I open up the box. They take the gadgets out. They switch them on, but they switch them on with a slow spirit. They say, we're going to use these things, but we're going to switch them off as well. I had one boy called Theo who at the beginning of the program was playing six hours a day of Xbox, FIFA, right, football on his... He just, and his parents had given up. They said, He's a, he will never, we don't know what to do anymore. By the end of the month, he got his Xbox back and he said, you know what, I, I'm still going to play Xbox, but I'm going to play it on Saturday and Sunday morning and maybe one evening a week and that's it. He said, I, I realize now that there are many other things that I like doing because during that month, I gave him slow activities. I got him to get on a bike he'd never used. I introduced him to some other boys in the street he'd never met. And suddenly, it was able to fill that hole, right? You, because I think that speed is like a drug, and if you take it away from people who are addicted, they have withdrawal symptoms. It's like a junkie. They, and you need to give them something to replace it. So in that program, I always give people slow activities to fill up the space that has been created by taking away the fast stuff. And then at the end of the month, they always come back and they say, okay, we want some of the fast back, but we don't want all the fast. We want some fast, but we want some slow. And each family forges its own recipe and its own balance. And, and I tell you, I've seen some families go through that. And I just, I thought myself, I thought, oh, I'm, th this is not going to work. These people will never change. And they did. So uh, they were so lucky that uh, you give them a workshop. But how many of <laughs> yes, them, <but> <laughs> how many of them are lucky around the world, especially? And he's a base. And I, d I, d I was in Silicon Valley just before Christmas or sort of last November, working with schools and families. And it's very interesting. You go to Silicon Valley where all of the parents work at Facebook, Twitter, you know, they're, they're, they all work, they're completely marinated in technology. But when you go to their houses, what are they doing now? They are not giving their kids the gadget. They are holding them back as long as possible, having times of day when they switch off. You know, they're, they're keeping it under control. And these are the people who make the gadgets and understand how the technology works. And they have come out the other side of this extreme journey and are now saying, okay, we want to keep some of it, but we want to come back to the middle. And another thing that makes me feel optimistic is that this rethink about the technology is not just happening from, say, parents in their 40s or, or 50, 60 somethings who didn't grow up with screens, who are trying to stop younger people. From, it's actually younger people, the digital generation, who are saying, whoa, this is too much. You know, I love Snapchat, Instagram is great, but it's too much. I want to be able to talk to people I can't. And so they're coming up with their own techniques and their own rituals. There's a thing you see a lot in London and New York now. It's a, it's a practice called stacking. And I don't know if people, you've seen it here. What happens is when young people go out to Starbucks and have a coffee or something, they sit around the table and everybody piles up their phone in the middle of the table in a stack. So they call it stacking, yeah? And whoever grabs the phone first to look at Snapchat or send a tweet pays the bill for everybody else, right? <laughs> so it's, it's just a way of saying, you know, we have this moment here together we'll never have this moment again. Why spoil it by trying to be in four or five other moments at the same time? And what's really optimistic about that, I think, is that that is young people, that is the digital natives, who we are often being told cannot exist without screens. They are, you know, they are, they are the same as everyone else. The, the human brain has not changed evolutionary-wise in the last 20 years. It just hasn't. That's not the way human evolution works. A child born in Abu Dhabi today has the same brain as a child born before Facebook in Abu Dhabi, right? Nothing has changed. What's changed is the environment, the circumstances they grew up in, and that starts to rewire the brain. But the, the truth is that a child born today, or a child you know, in this room, has the, same, has the same brain, which means they have the same needs, the same desires, but also the same limits. 
And that's why they're coming to the same conclusion. And so whenever I, I do a lot of work in schools as well, and you find all over the world kids, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, coming together in different ways to switch off, you know, whether they're getting the whole school to turn off for a week or they're creating homework hours in the evening when everybody turns off social media. You know, they're not giving up on these things. They're just saying a little less wouldn't be a lot more in a sense. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's important not to be pessimistic and, and to see that there are a lot of good things changing in this direction. So, hey, uh, we can all, I think this subject is good to be uh, discussed among the audience because sure. it, it has a lot of aspects. So please... Uh, <coughs> Uh, thank you very much. I think the subject is extremely interesting. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I didn't see. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's extremely interesting because it is uh, everyday talk and everyday, pr uh, not problem, challenge. It's everyday challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, how to go through the day with all these distractions, how to get more family moments. I would love uh, to be among the lucky ones to enroll to this program <laughs> so you can come to the I family. should do an Abu Dhabi version. <laughs> <coughs> well, actually, I'm in Abuja, so you need an African oh, right. version. <laughs> But no, it's really this is where, and as you said, it comes also with a lot of good feelings for the parents. Of course. Me as a parent, where did I miss things? What did I do wrong? That I end up with two kids on their iPads or in there. The question for me is, as you said, the right balance is for every family to find the tool and to find it mm -hmm. around this thing. The question is, finding this right balance how we can still keep our kids following on technology, catching up mm. on new things. Sometimes I feel, do we, are we overbuying? Like for them to, or downloading, for them to catch up with technology? Mm. Or by switching it for one month, is that still okay? Mm. And then they can catch up with their colleagues and peers in the schools, knowing that also school curriculum has changed and now it's more depending on iPads and technology than in written books. My kids have terrible handwriting. They don't care about it because they are not using it. For me, it's still like a big, heavy thing. How to so it, it is complicated in a way beyond the skill and speed. Yeah, well, the handwriting is an interesting one because they've shown that when students of all ages take notes by hand, they understand the material better and they remember it more, right? And the reason they do that is that handwriting forces you to slow down. If you're just typing one on a keyboard, you're not processing what comes through. You just write straight through. You want to keep it, you forget about it. Whereas if you're pretty by a net, you don't forget about it. I don't know what I'm saying. You have to slow down in order to pre-see it, right? So you have to digest it in the moment. So there's an example of how, you know, sometimes you know, the, the slower is actually more efficient than the faster, right? And so you're now finding universities and schools in Western countries looking for m moments or encouraging students to stop using the computer when before everybody was being pushed to use a the computer. They're saying, maybe during this seminar, you might want to have all the screens down and people just take notes by hand, right? A very small change, but you know, a, a deep change at the same time, right? So I, I sort of see it like that, that it's, there are lots of little battles to be fought and they're going to be fought in different ways, in different places. So universities, schools, homes, the workplace. We, we can't have one big recipe for it. It's going to be finding different balances here, there, and everywhere. It's going to be different at, at every level. But I, I, I feel like in any family, there is scope to sit down and say, OK, this is not quite working right? the way it is now. So forget what everybody else is doing. Who, forget the school. What, let's just work out what we, what we want, what's really important to us. And, and of course, being in touch with their um, friends on social media is a hugely important, what's important to us now as adults as well. It's not something you want to take away, but do you want it happening all the way through homework hour, right? Or so, you know, so it just, do you switch off? And I mean, I was at a school in Bath in the west of England a little while ago, and I was talking about some of these ideas. And afterwards, a group of the girls came up to me and they said, we've set up a slow, homework group, we didn't call it that, we called it, the, we call it the, um, the switch off group. So every day at the end of school, a group of friends who are all following each other feverishly on social media get together and they say, okay, this evening we reckon that we probably have about 90 minutes of homework. 
in the evening, so between 7.30 at 9 that night, everybody switches off social media, they put their phones in another room, they do the homework, they get it done well, they get it done faster, they get it done you know, more efficiently, and then they go back on Snapchat at the end. So, you know, it's just, and that had nothing to do with their parents, that was something that they did on their own, but it was part of a bigger conversation that the school was having with parents, with the pupils, and you need to have everybody around the table talking about it, because no, it's the old phrase, no man is an island, you know, that was John Donne centuries ago. It's even less so today. We're all so connected. So you can't arrive one day and just declare unilateral slowness or switch off without explaining why, right? You've got to, you know, explain and bring people along and maybe they'll do some with you and some won't and so on. I mean, I, I find that during making that, this program that the hardest thing for people to slow down with and you put your finger on it is the teenagers and social media. That, that, that's the hardest thing for them. And so they would, you know, they were able to use the phones outside the house. Of course, they go outside the house to use them and, and on, you know, but back in the house, for the, certainly for the first week or so, they're so used to being, but then over through the week, they found it was okay. And, and then I know that all the families go back to using the phones in the house. So sometimes they're using it, but not all the time, right? So again, it's that, um, I, I have my, my favorite example of a little victory, let's call it, or, or a little act of rebellion or resistance against the always-on technology comes from a, um, an entrepreneur that I met in the United States a little while ago. And he was, because he's American, he almost takes no vacation. And when he has a vacation, it's about three days, right? And he said to me, about five years ago, I realized that my vacations w were not really vacations because I was just getting messages and emails and I was answering and I was never stopping. And I was exhausted and my doctor, and I was stressed and I couldn't sleep and I just, I wasn't working. I was, it was, I, I needed to do something. So he said, I came up with a solution, and his solution was this. He started sending, when he went on his vacations, his three, four-day vacations, he would send an automatic email reply. So any email that would come in would get a reply back saying, thank you for your email. I, I, w I'm, I would love to be in touch with you, and I'm on vacation at the moment for the next three days. I get back next Tuesday, and I will write back to you then because I'm not looking at email during this vacation. But if your email is urgent, and you need a reply now before I come back from my vacation, please resend the same email, but to a different address. And the address he put that you're supposed to send it to is ruinmyvacation at yahoo.com, right? You know? <laughs> and you know what he said to me? He said to me, in five years, no one has written to that email address. And in five years, I have not missed a work deadline. I have not lost out on an assignment. I have not alienated a friend or a colleague or a client. And I am 10 times healthier, 50 times happier, and a way better parent, husband, and worker. So, you know, that was just one thing that one guy has done. But it's just those, I think I'm seeing more and more of these little, you could even call them hacks, right? That people are just saying, in my life, this is what I'm going to do. My life, this will work better for me, but it's all moving in the same direction. And it just gets easier and easier. The more examples there are of people saying, you know what? Sometimes slower is better, right? Sometimes waiting is okay. <laughs> and that just gets easier for everybody else to do it when you see other people um, doing the same thing. Dr. Uh, Dr. Carl, thank you to come to Al Multaqa. It's really, we appreciate you. You are with us today. We thank read you. your book uh, one year ago. And it's really <laughs> the change our life. Since I read your book, I decide to do what's in the book. I be slow, I do what I want, and, uh, but I want to ask you because uh, you know UAE, <laughs> really, it's really affecting us here. Uh, about uh, the now with artificial uh, intelligence now. Ah. And everything quick, quick, quick. And if, you don't, if you are not there, you are very old style. What we, even we want to be like this, but you know, our, uh, the surrounding us, the environment, it's the push us to be always quick, quick. How the solution we find, and how we, we, we can be relaxed. We don't feel something is, will uh, always we think something is, will, uh, lost, uh, we will lost uh, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. How we can, with ourselves, in ourselves, to be slow, and uh, also the influence for you, the family. How you think the most important to do it then? Well, there's, that's uh, several questions, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, th I think it's important to remember one thing, which is one of the points, of course, I make in the book which is that people often think, and you, you kind of said it in your question, how can I slow down because if I slow down, life will pass me by, right? FOMO, I'll miss out on all these things. But actually the opposite is true, that life is what's happening right here, <laughs> right now. It's not all the other things that are going, it's this moment. 
And the only way to live this moment is to slow down and be completely present in it. And I think once you make that change of switch in your head, a lot of things start to fall into place. It becomes easier to say no to things. It becomes easier to switch off. It becomes easier to wait or to ask other people to wait. Um, so I think a, a kind of mindset or cultural change in your head is important. But then there are lots of little things that we can all do, I think, to, um, to reinforce that. One thing that I like is doing is, you know, we all have a to-do list, yeah? I think it's very useful to have a not-to-do list. So you, on, you have your to-do list and maybe every day, every day you take one thing off because we're tr all trying to do way too many things, most of which are not that important, right? Take one thing off that and put it on the not-to-do list. And then keep the not-to-do list and look at it later, like a, a month later. Because I think at the, at the moment when we say no to something, we feel panic, we feel guilt, we feel shame, we feel afraid, we think, oh no, my whole world is going to end because I'm not doing this one thing. When the truth is that that's not the case for most things in our lives. <laughs> most things in our lives are not that important, right? They just feel important in the moment. But if you pull it off your list, overcome the panic of the moment, put it on your not-to-do list, and then look at it six weeks from now, and look at your not-to-do list, you'll think, why did I even, why was I even worried about that thing? Because you've got a bit of perspective. You look back and think, well, now that I can see, it, it wasn't that important. And I think, again, that just sort of, it, it's like building up a muscle, a slow muscle that says, yeah, I can, I can do this. It's okay. The world, the sky will not fall in if I say no, right? In fact, many, many good things happen when people start saying no. We're, we're all chronically trying to do too many things and saying yes way too much. And I think saying no and having, so having a, no, a not to do list is a useful thing I find as well. And then just building in any kind of sort of practice or ritual or something that slows you down in your day. I mean, it could be people, a lot of people do yoga or meditation or knitting or puzzles or anything that just kind of help, because can, you can get infected by other people's impatience and you might go out of the house in the morning thinking, here I am, I'm all very slow, and then you collide with other people and suddenly you're feeling like that again. Yeah. So it's useful to have some kind of practice that just stops you, right? Just stop, just every once in a while stop and say, uh, do I need to go this fast? Because often we, we're going fast not because we need to, but just because, I don't know, momentum or habit or inertia or because other people are going fast. So just sometimes just to stop and say, okay, two deep breaths. What's my speed now? Is it too fast? Often it is, and just slow down. Because so much of what we do, we do out of habit without actually thinking about it. And once you st stop and think, you realize that there are, that there are often many, many spaces and moments when you can slow down. Now it's, uh, you know that uh, you buy, you are at home. You buy your grocery, you buy your uh, shopping, you, you do your, uh, all your, um, you pay all from the bank through internet, uh, everything you do it uh, now without communication with people. Mm. And uh, I think for a new generation, how they will talk? They talk with themselves? Because we didn't have communication with others. I think the more dangerous now, what we see around us, it's uh, no communication. And what do you think about that one? Yani, uh, shall we show our uh, grandchildren no communication with us? I do think it's, uh, I think it's a worry. I, think, I don't think it's m only a problem now for children. I think the whole society now is spending, for every generation is spending too much time not talking and too much time looking at screens. I mean, obviously there's, the numbers show that children are doing more of it and getting less. I mean, that generation that, I mean, my generation, we grew up without screens, so we had all of that training and we had to talk, right? Or, or not just talk. Sometimes you have to be with another human being in silence. Or and it might be uncomfortable, right? You know, that's, that's just life, right? But it's so easy now when you're on a screen, you, if there's silence, you just ignore it or you don't feel it or you never, if you're uncomfortable, you swipe left or you turn the person off or you unmatch them or whatever it is. Um, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a techno optimist, so I feel like, as I was saying earlier, I feel like we've gone over, we've gone too far with the technology, but we're realizing the damage it's doing and we're now kind of bringing it back. So I think that we will, or I hope that we will, get to a point where we're using the technology, the social side of it, for, for the good, because it, it adds layers of communication. If you have the slow human stuff as well, you need the two things. Um, but yeah, no, obviously at the moment, I think many people are not getting enough of the 
the slow and they're only getting, um, getting the fast. Welcome, Carl. You're, you're very welcome here. Thank you. I was wondering if you could talk about some of the other types of slow in your book. There were several different types, such as slow food and other types of slow. Slow, sorry? Other types of slow in the book, sure. Uh -huh. um, that might be my cue to talk about sex, could it be? <laughs> <Don't you? laughs> um, no? You talk, right. no, uh, food. I no, yeah. actually, you can't, you can't yeah. talk and I want to come. make people do sex faster mm -hmm. and then you came and you told them no you have to do it slower so maybe there are so many aspects yeah i mean that's what's so extraordinary about this slow revolution is that it does touch every every single aspect of life so there are movements now for you know slow medicine slow travel slow fashion there's a huge slow fashion movement uh, you know slow architecture slow design slow just every single thing you can imagine with slow uh, and slow sex right and um I mean, one, it is extraordinary how the virus of hurry has infected really every corner of people's lives. I mean, there was a, a news story in Britain a little while ago about a couple who were getting divorced, and they went to the court, and the judge said, what went wrong? Why are you here? And the husband said, well, Your Honor, you know, it's a long story. We married young, and we grew apart over the years. But the moment I knew our marriage was finished, just over, was one night when we were in bed together, my wife and I, and we were making love. And I closed my eyes for just a few seconds, and when I opened them up again, I caught my wife reading email on her iPhone. You know, while we're in the middle of... Now, obviously, there are, two, there are two conclusions that we can draw from that story. The first is clearly that the husband, not in question, that guy needs to brush up on his bedroom technique, I think, probably. But the second conclusion is the one that is more useful for us now, and that is that, you know, that, I mean, to be even in that most intimate moment, distracted by a screen or unable to focus on one thing at a time, it just seems to me to show that we've lost our, our bearings, right? Um, and, you know, and, and even when people do manage to leave their phones outside the, um, the bedroom, it is extraordinary how people do, as you say, want to accelerate the act of lovemaking. There was a, a magazine in, in London not so long ago that had a headline which was a, just stopped me in my tracks. It was, you know, ha it said, it was, a, it was a magazine for couples, right? For n normal couples, and it said, technique, how to bring her or woman to, you know, orgasm in 30 seconds, right? So it's kind of like, it's sort of, it's like on your marks, get set, go. It's like, a, it's like a sport, you know, that people are, um, but I, you know, whenever I mention, I, I have mentioned that technique of the 30 seconds to, and whenever I do in a public place, the same thing always happens. And that's that a few men in the audience always come up to me and they say, what was the name of the magazine? <laughs> and the, and the issue to <laughs> But, but no man, no woman has ever done that, and I think that's probably because women have a natural understanding for the uh, fact that so slower is better. Uh, sure. Well, of course, in travel now, there's a whole slow travel movement. Oh, there's a question, is there? Sure. Like that. Dr. Carl, thank you to be sure. here. Now, let me follow you. you s just now you mentioned that you have to slow down and you have to stop. Suppose I have agenda. I have many points to do with every single day. Mm. Then I said, okay, I'm gonna stop. Then I'm gonna look at myself because maybe it was my habit or something. Then I believe I need, I need like double of time or trouble of time just to follow what I have to do every day. Mm. So I'll waste more time, I'll, wa I'll, wa I'll need more efforts to reach, uh, suppose my colleagues or maybe sometimes my work push me to do many things or to do many things in, in, in very fast way. So what I have to do in this uh, mm -hmm. situation. You got me, sir. Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah, yeah. Well, I would say two things. One is if you're, if you're it's more difficult to slow down in the workplace if you're at the mercy of a boss or a company that doesn't understand, of course. If you're working for yourself or freelance, then you have more freedom to slow down sensibly, right? But if you're in a, a boss with a company, then what I always recommend is that you start some kind of conversation in the company, because you, you will not be the only person feeling that way, right? So you get together the people who feel that way and you approach the person who has the power to allow you to do something maybe a little differently and say, and just propose an experiment. Say, you don't have to say, let's change the whole company tomorrow. You can say, let's have a week where... But in our life, the people will pass by me and they will reach and... They will get, and who will, will pass by you? Um, maybe my colleagues, maybe... Uh, well, that's why I'm saying, you, you, if you're 
you cannot do it on your own. You have to get those colleagues together who also feel under ridiculous pressure and say, okay, for this week, we're going to, I don't know, switch off our phones for one hour in the afternoon, or we're going to go home from the office at 6 p.m. for the week and just see how it works. At the end of the week, come back and say, did it work? Maybe it worked a bit, or we could change this and so on. And just get experiments going so that people can try doing something different. It's not enough just to sit there and complain. Don't you it's also not enough just to say, I'm not playing this game anymore, because that won't work either. You'll just get steamrollered by all your colleagues, as you say. You have to do it together, and you have to start a conversation where you show through experience mm. and uh, real practice that slowing down will actually be better for the company, because you'll make fewer mistakes. And there's, there's also this thing that I call the delicious paradox of slow. We've, we've wound ourselves up into this idea that faster is always more efficient. When nine times out of ten, it's not. We make more mistakes. Efficiency kills creativity. The only way to be creative is to slow down. It, you, when you're constantly going fast and feeling busy, you're less healthy. You're not sleeping as well. You, just so many things are worse, right? <laughs> so if, we, if you just can get the company to say, okay, let's at least try slowing down, they will see the benefits. And then over time, you can start creating a company culture where human beings are treated as human beings and as a result are productive and creative and the company thrives. But don't you won't do that in one week, right? Don't you, you, think you won't do it alone. Don't you think, doctor, if, uh, if I slow down, I will lose chances? Well, it depends how you slow down. If you slow down alone in a company, yes, of course you will. But that's why I'm saying don't do it alone. Get together, because I bet you you're not the only person who feels that way in your yes. company. Yes. So I would say to you, get together the people who feel that way go to your boss and say, look, we feel that there's a chance that we would actually be better employees if we were able to slow down in this, this way, that way, and this way. So why don't we at least try an experiment? Let's just see what happens, trial and error. Maybe this won't work, but maybe this will. Look at what other companies are doing. Have a quiet room. Um, have, like Volkswagen did, stop emails being sent by staff outside working hours, right? You know, it might not work in your company, but some version of it might, right? So if you, if you just look around the world and, and just pluck examples and say, okay, let's try this in our company, see if it works. And when, once companies start doing it, they see the payoff, they see that it actually is good for the bottom line, for the productivity of the company, then there's no argument against it. Everybody, everybody wins. But it takes courage and it takes togetherness, right? You won't do it alone. That, that, I totally agree. You'll just get smoked if you do it by yourself. Sorry, I can't hear you. I can't hear. I will just try to do the not listed list from tonight. I will do it. You're trying to do the what? Not the not, list. not to do list. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. I love yeah. the idea. Well, that's one for that's a personal one though, right? So that's not the kind of company Why coming not? together. But you could probably find things in your own life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a good place to start. <laughs> yeah. You got a week. <laughs> All oh, right. Okay. So, any more questions? No, I will just do uh, a comment in the same uh, line with what he has been saying. Uh, for 20 years, I had been in the humanitarian sector. I'm still in, and this is a sector or an industry which is fast by definition. It's about saving lives, and it's about lives of colleagues which in the front line. You can't switch off your phone. You can't sleep really. Mm. You can't. And what happened, I think this is what the whole industry started to, to realize in the last five years only, how many of our colleagues who had sudden death due to heart attacks, burned out, nerve breakdown, and we lost completely the ability to have a normal family life. Mm -hmm. Divorce had been the highest in the industry compared to any other field. And you cannot find even a successful love story, let alone a married one. Mm. And this is where I think now, as you said, it starts by s um, individual voices here and there, and now it's contagious. Everyone is trying to slow down and saying that saving lives, but to stay alive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I and, and you know, companies now in, in you know, Europe and North America, many of them have what they call chief happiness officers, you know, people whose job is to focus on all those things you just said are going wrong, to keep their employees healthy, happy, because, 
I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science. A healthy, happy employee is a productive employee, right? So even if a company doesn't really care about its employees, even if it only cares about the bottom line and productivity, it still makes sense to slow down, right? And that's, that's the, the cold, hard truth of it, which is why many companies are doing it. And, and these companies, for the most part, I think, probably don't care. <laughs> What's driving it is productivity. It's, it's, it's profit, right? So, but if you can, if you can, that's why I feel we should feel optimistic about this slow culture quake is that it actually is more, you know, profitable in the long run. Carl, we look forward to, to read the Boulder. Uh, when is it coming to be published? Uh, well, it's already out in English now and now it's starting Perfect. now in other languages so coming out. So we'll buy it. And uh, I would like to thank you uh, for your presence and for this important uh, tips that we learned a lot out of it. Thank you. And we look forward to have you again for a workshop or just uh, something on a longer term in order to learn and to train. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank we you. really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.